<laughs> nah. No, 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 no. Here I am, the student, and we are not live, but we are being recorded. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Conversation and Calculation, episode 18. Hi, this is a big one. Why doesn't our esteemed guests introduce themselves? Hi, Ruben Russell here. So happy to be on the 18th episode called, what is it called? Conversation. Conversation. And calculation. Calcu what are we calculating? So, so, it's supposed to be a play on Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs's Covenant and Conversation. Ah. I see this as like the spiritual successor. Uh, and he had a whole Torah about how covenant and conversation is what describes Torah Shabbat Sav, where it's comprised primarily of covenants and conversations. And I saw Torah Shabbat Peh as being a conglomeration of conversations and calculations. So that, that's, that, that's, that's why I called it that. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Well... Ellie, uh, it's nice to be here with you. I've known you for a couple of months now on a play that we're doing here downstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, old timers game per, uh, airing or what? What is it called? Well, like opening well, night. Opening night is April fourth. Monday night, April fourth. Yeah. We, uh, we we have shows Monday night the fourth, then Wednesday night the sixth, Thursday night the seventh. Then we close with a double header, two performances on Sunday, April the 10th. Yeah, one matinee and one evening performance. Correct. Yeah, so I'm very excited for this. You know, we, we've been putting a lot into this, and I think it's going to be a phenomenal production. I really think so. So you can talk about the play and the process if you want, whatever you want. Yeah, this yeah. Is, uh, so, this is your show. So, so, uh, <laughs> so I was actually curious because if Professor doesn't mind me asking, you know, I, I I just entered Shaduchim, right? And <laughs> Amen. Thank you. And one of the first things that came across was, you know, people started Googling my name. And they found my actor's access and my backstage, right? And I'm kind of having to come to terms with like my acting as a passion and my being an Orthodox Jew, mm. you know? You, so, you go right to the jug, you waste no time, right? I, <laughs> you go right to the chase here, don't you? I, I, so I thought I, we were gonna build up to this, uh, you know, after 40 minutes, but no. Okay, good. Yeah, so I, I mean, like, if Professor wouldn't mind talking about it, because this is something that I feel really passionate about, and this is something that I'm really genuinely curious about, um, how Professor has straddled these two worlds, and, Managed to successfully cultivate both. Meaning, I don't want it to. It ain't over yet. Let me just. Say that. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't want to see it as as a as a contradiction, and I don't think it has to be. I don't think it has to be. So I'm curious. What are professors' thoughts? So this is all. This we can we can talk hours just on this one question alone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I will say this. Um, I have not been observant my entire life. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first 25 years of my life, um, I was not observant and I grew up in what they used to call in America a conservative uh, household where in my particular case, we uh, were not Shoma Shabbos um, we kept kosher in the house, but would, you know, go out to eat and was told, don't bring that food into the house. Okay. That was something, I don't know if that's still done anymore, um, but that was sort of like the conservative branch, conservative, what, what people call conservative Judaism now, I think is much different than the conservative synagogue I grew up in, in West Haven, Connecticut. Right. Uh, but, so, um... I was involved with the world and theater and all this stuff before I came to observant Judaism. Uh, my father, Oliver Shalom, was a comedian. He was Joey Russell. So I'm the baby of five children. Um, 
So it kind of makes sense. So I, you know, I, I, I always tell people I'm, I'm really just a nice Jewish boy going into my father's business. <laughs> um, he was in show business my, my whole life. Like I said, stand-up comedian, Jewish humorist. Um, went, went to the Friars Club back when the Friars Club in New York City was sort of the ultimate... Um, used to be strictly a men's club, men only. And Fascinating. Then, uh, I believe it was in the 80s at some point. They then allowed women, and it's, it's, it's a little different now, but it was always a showcase for, for the great comedians. Wow. So that was, you know, my, my upbringing, I, I sort of grew up in a show business house. My mother, she should live and be well, ran a costume rental house. Oh, that's and, so nice. Uh, in New Haven, Connecticut for probably close to 50 years. Uh, right after I was born in 1961, she opened up um, uh, she opened up a costume shop and she ran that many, many, many years. And um, so between my mom being a, a customer and she was also a, a theatrical seamstress, she, she knew how to sew and to repair wow. and you know all this stuff. and she, she ran a business. She was the business owner. and my, my dad was on the road quite a lot uh, when I was growing up. And uh, I would travel with him sometimes and see him perform. So that's, that's how I, I came to it. So when 25 or 26 years old came around and I uh, took my backpack and decided to take a trip to Europe, Back then, there was something called the Eurail Pass. I don't know if they still have it anymore. It was, I believe they do. You buy one and you travel all through yeah. Europe. One pass, you just you, and the trains take you all through Europe. And again, um, it's a whole different scene now. But before nine eleven, traveling was a whole different picture, um, especially through Europe. And I found myself um, sort of migrating just towards the Jewish centers in each of the major cities. So if I would go to Paris, if I would go, um, I went to Vienna, if I went to, uh, you know, Germany, and any of the countries that I went to, I, w I would always find, back then you had a book, it was called um, The Jewish Traveler's Guide, I think it was called. Mm. It was a book, I mean, you know, not everything is in the palm of your hand. Right. But back then, you, know, you had a, there was a book, The Jewish Traveler's Guide, and you're traveling here, this is what, and here's the address. And you had, you had paper maps. You know, you know what those are, a paper map? <laughs> so I'm, I'm familiar. I've been, I've been going <laughs> uh, through uh, all of my grandfather's old stuff. So I, I believe I know what you're talking about. There, we have a, a Europe on $5 a day. That yes, sounds, that sounds yes, pretty Jewish. Yes. You know, we are, in a, we are in a room, I don't know if the people can see it, but we are in a room surrounded with record albums. Now, I have, I have oh, Journey. Look at this, Journey. Yeah. Journey, okay? I, I have a record collection, not, not the size of what we just saw in the other room, but I probably have a couple hundred records, and I remember, wow. um, you know, I have five kids, Kanai Nahara, and I remember one of my kids saying to me at one point, probably about 15 years ago, he went down to the basement and he pulled out one of my records and he said to me, Abba, is this how they used to listen to music in the olden days? <laughs> so that made me feel a little bit old. But, wow. You know. It's crazy how society has progressed so quickly in the last several decades. As we speak. Yeah, literally as we speak. So, so you were in the middle of saying how, so you found yourself gravitating towards the Jewish centers in Europe. Yeah, and um, this was the summer of 85. And why was I in Europe? I was in Europe because I had auditioned. I went. I went to um, undergraduate. I went. I went to public high school. So just a my, the, from kindergarten to eighth grade, I went to New Haven Hebrew Day School. Okay. Which is a Chabad Day School, but it's filled even to this day with all t all different types of families. It's not. It's not Chabad families. It's, it's got it. It's a community school. It's a community school. A day school. Got it. And. Um, I went there through eighth grade, then went to four years of public high school, and then I went to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh for uh, undergrad. Uh, left after a year and a half. I was in, I was a, I majored in acting there. They Carnegie Mellon still they're they're two big what they're known for engineering and theater. Right, right. <laughs> so you know you have your big engineers that come out of there. You also have you know terrific. Uh, theater people that come out of it, uh, not only actors, but designers and directors and playwrights. And um, left there after uh, a year and a half and um, 
decided to do some street performing in New York City in Manhattan. I would go in and I, I've done a lot of, um, since my dad also and a couple of my brothers did a lot of uh, birthday parties to make money growing up. They put on a clown suit and makeup and they did a little magic show. So I have a little, um, I have a little background in magic and children's, so cool. children's uh, shows. Um, I've probably, you know, from the age when I could drive since 16 through, well, I, I just did a little kid show. I just did a kid show, Purim. Um, really? Just, just, uh, just last week in New Haven. Wow. <laughs> um, I've probably done, um, well, probably close to about 3,000 shows, um, magic shows for kids. Um, so uh, I did a lot of street performing. And it, during that time, I wanted to take some more acting lessons. And I studied with one of the greatest acting teachers, arguably ever, um, who was Stella Adler. Of course. Yeah. And uh, studied with her in her class uh, for about two years. That's a whole nother, another chapter we can talk about. Yeah, I would um, love to. <laughs> but, you know, she, she demanded the truth on stage. It was, you know, it's funny because she, if you were to ask me, pick a person that had the most um, influence and effect on your becoming observant, I would have to say it was Stella Adler, and let me tell you why. Fascinating. You know, Stella Adler was not an observant Jew herself. Right. But she demanded in her acting class that you be truthful on the stage. Now, what does that mean? They say great acting is being truthful in imaginary circumstances. So she was tough. She was tough when, when, when she asked you to bring in a scene or a monologue. If she felt you were not doing very well, she would interrupt you, tell you to come off, sweetheart, come off the stage, you don't belong there, come sit down and let's talk. So it came to a point where if you wanted to get through your scene that you worked so hard on or your monologue, you did everything you could to make sure you were truthful in what you were doing. And like I said, I was with her for about two years, and she kept saying, you know, the stage is the only place where you can, where you cannot tell a lie. You want to tell a lie anywhere else? Go out on the street. You'll see everybody telling a lie. Hi, how are you? So <laughs> nice to see you. Hi, what a lovely day. So nice to see you. And she would say, that's where, you, on the stage, you can't lie. This was her approach to the theater. And I was sitting there, for two years listening to this and I said so you, the stage is the only place where you cannot lie you must be truthful when you walk on that stage as if it was a a holy space so right. to speak and I started thinking to myself well this whole idea of being truthful being truthful being truthful on the stage hmm could we now that it could can we extend that now and is it what does it mean to be truthful in life and that's when I started learning a little bit and I would open up some Torah and learn some Torah and there was, there, I discovered a truth with a capital T, wow. which was the truth out in the world. And there was a, there, there was a truth, there was, there was an MS to live by our lives, not just on that place called the stage. So it's sort of interesting how it was Stella Adler who triggered this question in my mind of truth. And I went from the truth, being truthful in the theater to what does it mean, how do we translate that back to being truthful in life? And that was my transition into learning more and learning more and learning more and becoming more observant little by little. Um, you know, I didn't have to. I didn't start from Olive Bays because obviously I had gone to day school as a kid from university through eighth grade, so I wasn't learning Olive Bays again. But um, you know, I, I learned what it meant to keep Shabbos and to keep kosher, and and what it what it meant a little bit to learn. Um, and the reason why I was mentioning I went to Europe is because so I I, I um, in in that interim when I left Carnegie Mellon. I was studying with Stella Adler. I was also studying with another very good acting teacher, 
uh, the actor Michael Moriarty. If you, I can't say I've heard of him. If but. you Google him, you'll see he's he was a big star at one time. Um, he was he was first known for the t TV series that he did with Meryl Streep when Meryl Streep was a quite a young woman, um, called Holocaust. Just the one word, Holocaust, and it was. Um, a, I don't know, four or five or six or ten part television series. And um, he played the role of, uh, of a Nazi officer who was having trouble carrying out a lot of the uh, orders that most Nazis did. And, you know, it was the first time we saw, like, someone struggling with the, you know, a moral or ethical struggle, and yet, you know, he's wearing a Nazi uniform. So um, that was his first sort of um, rise to fame, and terrific actor. Um, he was the first, uh, he was the first, I forget the character's name, Law and Order. You, you know Law and Order. Of course. Well, well, the original Law and Order, not all the branches that, that finally came in there, but the original Law and Order, he was, he was the original four guys on Law and Order. Wow. So Michael Moore. Along with... I have to mention, you, you can't talk about Jewish actors and not mention Stephen Hill. And, and let me tell you something, Stephen Hill, not, not just a Jewish actor, one of the best actors ever. Yeah. Talk about being truthful. Talk about, you know, there's, there's an interview, one of the greatest interviewers, by the way, if you want to know, I mean, you're, as far as I know so far, you're, <laughs> you're a pretty good interviewer. Thank you. One of, the, one of the great interviewers, Bob Costas. I've heard of He's him. He's a sports guy. Yeah. He did a show, I think it was called The Late Late Show or something like that, uh, or Late Late Night with Bob Costas, something like that in, in, the, in the 80s and the 90s. He had this knack of being able to draw out of his guests things that you never heard them say before. Um, he just had this knack, he was a great interviewer. Why am I mentioning him? Because I remember, and you can look this up, you can probably find it, Stephen Hill, who you just mentioned, was on the Bob Costa show. Wait, scratch that. Let me take that back. <laughs> no, because I here's what I'm thinking. Alan Arkin, the great actor Alan Arkin, was on Bob Costas. Bob Costas asked Alan Arkin, who do you think, who, who do you revere? as great actors, and the first person he mentioned was Stephen Hill. Really? Wow. And you watch Stephen Hill's work, I mean, it's just, it's this whole idea of being truthful. I had the pleasure of meeting Stephen Hill when I... Really? Um, so I, I don't know how much, you know, chronologically we went, so I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but <laughs> um, no, but there, there's no question you can't, you can't talk about this without mentioning Stephen Hill, and Stephen Hill, I met with him, we spoke about it because we were, I was, um, you know, approaching and, and, and confronting the same things that, that, that he was. Um, I think the story was when he, he was on the original Mission Impossible. Right. He was the, the original. television show. Yeah. Not the television the show. Yeah. Right. And that's when he was first starting to keep Shabbos. And I guess um, things weren't working out. And he had to leave because it was just better for him to leave. Um, but so I studied with Stella. I studied with Michael Moriarty. And why am I saying this? Because I auditioned for the Yale School of Drama, a graduate school. Okay. It's a three-year wow. program, still is. It's now called, it was just, the name changed, was just this year, it's now called the David Geffen School of Drama at Yale. Um, that's what $150 million can do. It'll put, <laughs> it'll put your name put on your name, school. Put your name. <laughs> no, call a couple to David Geffen. Yeah. Um, you know, no, no more, no, no one has to worry about tuition to go to the Yale School of Drama. I think it's the, wow. I think it's true now for the, for the Yale School of Music as well. It's been that way for really? years. Really? Sure. Wow. Um, That's incredible. So I auditioned for the Yale School of Drama, did not get in my first time. But I got into this side summer program that they held at Oxford University in England in conjunction with BADA, the British American Drama Academy. So I did not get into Yale proper, but I got into this other program, so I went, summer of 85, 
and that's where we're getting, we're circling back now to my, my Ural pass and traveling through <laughs> Europe. I was in England for six weeks and then I traveled Europe. And I remember specifically going through, traveling through Europe um, and speaking with um, Chabad rabbis, specifically it was Rosh Hashanah time. I remember being in Zurich, Switzerland and just talking and we were sitting there uh, you know gazing at the beautiful mountains in Switzerland and the water below and the mountains and you know being asked questions like so you know what are you going to do with your life what's life all about what's the meaning of life etc cetera, etc cetera. and i remember just coming home from that whole england europe trip right between russia and yom kippur uh, i was back home from yom kippur and i decided and it was just step by step uh, you know, little by little, and I decided that, um, you know, I wanted to start living a life, um, as Stella Adler said, of truth, not just on stage. Wow. I didn't want to be truthful just on stage. I wanted to be truthful in life, too. So um, I really do credit uh, Stella Adler, may she rest in peace, to my becoming observant in Judaism, as crazy as that story sounds. <laughs> That's fascinating. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, so... Where do we go from here? How do I combine the two? Um, that's a good question. So I know that what Stephen Hilda did was um, he took a a recurring, uh, I, I forget the term, a recurring role on Law & Order as the DA, mm -hmm. and he wore a toupee. Or at least legend has it. Well, I can tell you that I went to Muncie and went to his house and we had a little lunch together. Really? Because I reached out and set up that meeting. It was not a very encouraging meeting. He was very nice, but it was not encouraging in terms of, yeah, go do this. Uh, you know, make a kid to Hashem. No, it was not this. It was... Let me tell you some of the obstacles you're going to come up against. And I remember clearly him telling me, you're going to be on the set of a film, and you have to deal... First of all, there's, there's anti-Semitism of people. No, I never encountered that. On, on, I've, I've done a few films. I've never encountered that. But this is what he was telling me. He was telling me, which I didn't think of, he says, you know, we have to wear different costumes as actors. Well, Judaism tells us we can't wear shotness. So yeah. he was telling me that in Law and Order, any jacket or suit that he had to put on, he yeah. had it in his contract to get a check for shotness. That it had to be checked for wow. shotness. Wow! So, and what he did was he he, he asked his rub, and I remember like all these details. He said, so typically what happens is you go to a fitting first. They have to make sure it fits you. So what do you, you're going to have a check? No, he says if you don't walk dalat amis, if you don't walk four amis with it, you can just stay there, put it on. And yes, it fits. No, if it should. And then if they if that's what they want you to wear, then they they adjust it, and you'll get it checked afterwards. So that was that. He also said the same thing about covering his head. Now, he told me he didn't tell me a toupee, but he told me that many of his scenes were done either sitting down. If you watch Law and Order, he's sitting in at the at a desk. And again, it's this idea of not walking Dalad Amos without a yarmulke. Fascinating. Fascinating. So I, I actually looked into it a bit, and, and Rav Moshe Feinstein has a tshuva about, in Negros Moshe, about not wearing a yarmulke for, for Parnassa. So I was just like thinking about it in terms of this, and... Does he say anything like this? What does he say? So Rav Moshe says that, that he gave a heter to not wear, not wear a yarmulke in the workplace. He said that people should be makbid to, to wear a yarmulke when saying a bracha or shem Hashem, right. even in the workplace. But, but he said that if, if, a, if wearing a yarmulke will impede one's parnasa, then Ramosha gave a heter to not wear a yarmulke in the workplace. Interesting. Yeah. Now, um, I'm a follower of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Okay. I'm, I'm a Chabadnik at heart. And I actually wrote a letter. Um, way back in 1989-ish, 89-90, uh, about this dilemma I had of now I wanted to live a life of being, you know, a from Jew. 
and this is my background and, and you know I have a theater background and film and act I'm an actor what do I, how do I combine the two so uh, I had written a letter to the Rebbe and I told him that I was uh, I was contemplating moving out west to be uh, more around the film and television industry because that would be more conducive to a Shomer Shabbos schedule. That, that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, it's crazy, but I literally have, have been having the same exact thoughts that like, as much as I love theater, but TV and film just seems to be much more practical in terms of being Shomer Shabbos. Okay, but we're, 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 we're just in chapter one of this interview. Okay, Before okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just telling you where I'm at. No, 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 and you know what? Um, Look, I'll st we should preface this whole conversation with this. I'm of the belief, when I say I, it's not, it's not my, you know, chiddush here. It's, it's, you know, um, the Rebbe believed, and Judaism says, Torah says, that if you have a talent, it has to be used. Right. God did not give us talents to then not use and lock ourselves up in a room with a safer. Chizkiyo HaMelech was actually admonished for not utilizing his talents, specifically of, of singing. He was, he was known to have a, a fantastic voice. Right. And, and, and Tanakh actually, actually reprimands him for not using it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in this crazy business called show business, whether it's theater, whether it's film, whether it's television, whether it's stand-up, whether it's you know pick 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 a pick a branch on the tree. Um, how do you how do you how do you do that? How do you combine it? So, did I finish the Stephen Hill part? Um, so you, I know we're jumping around a little bit. Right, that's all right. That's so all right. My meeting with him was basically him telling me, "Be very careful. It's not going to be uh, fun out there. Okay. Um, there's not going to be a lot of opportunity. There's not going to, you know, it was a very uh, straightforward, sort of cold reality check type of a conversation where." Um, It's, it's, it's not conducive. This business, the bottom line of our, of our conversation was that the business is simply not conducive. You know, he would say, I was in this way before I became observant in my Judaism, right? Which he was, the whole Mission Impossible right. thing and all his whole story. By the way, is there a book on his life? There should be. I don't know. There should be. Someone should write a biography on that. Yeah. Who, whoever's watching this, you, any writers out there, Wow. The, the Stephen Hill story is. Yeah. That's a book. Yeah, that's definitely a book. Um, I would say it's a biopic. Let me tell you another person that I also reached out to and had an impression on me, and that um, was the writer Herman Wook. Herman Wook, does that name? Mm, doesn't ring a bell. Thank you for making me feel really old. I'm sorry. <laughs> Herman, Herman Wu just passed away a year or two ago, I believe, at the age of 102. Wow. And he wrote, well, he's known for um, Marjorie Morningstar was the very first book, I think, that, that sort of launched him into stardom. But the movie The Kane Mutiny with Humphrey Bogart. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Which then he wrote a play the Kane Mutant Court Martial that went on Broadway. It's had revivals, terrific play. I've directed it, I've been in it. And so I wrote a letter to Herman Wu. When did I write it? When I was at Yale. So let me just backtrack one little bit. So that first time I didn't get into Yale, but I went on the England program, I came back. I auditioned for Yale the second year, that following year. Now we're talking 86. Auditioned, got in. Now, let me just tell you what it means to get in, and it's still the same thing now. The School of Drama, the acting program, has 16 per class, 16 students per class. And I believe the breakdown is still the same all these years later. 10 men, six women. 
at the time, there was probably about a thousand people auditioning for sixteen spots. I'm I'm sure the numbers are much higher now. Yeah, I'm sure they've only grown. Thank God I got in. Wow. And I remember my first year at Yale. Um, I wrote a letter to Herman Wilk. As a matter of fact, uh, maybe if I ever come back on your show, I'll bring it and I'll show it because oh, I have it framed. That would be incredible. I, I wrote him a letter, and then I what, I what what do I have framed? His response, his letter back to me. Wow. Yeah. And my letter to him was basically what we've been talking about. I said, Mr. Wilk, um, I'm now at the Yale School of Drama. I'm, um, I come from a family of show business. I, want, I'm, I, I love showbiz. I love Yiddishkeit. How do we combine the two? And his answer back to me basically was, that's a tough one. He said, uh, you know, he said, but he said, I understand that people who uh, have the talent and, and need to act um, is, is what did he call it? He called it a, he called it a, um, he called acting is a mugs game. This was, these were his words in his letters to me, meaning a wretched profession. <laughs> That's what he said. It's a mugs game, a wretched profession. Um, he says, but I, I also know that those who need, feel that they need to act must, must do so and, you know, must pursue their creative talents. Combining it with Yiddishkeit is a tough one, but I wish you the best of luck. Uh, Oh, and I had mentioned Stephen Hill in my letter. See, it's all sort of connected there. <laughs> I mentioned Stephen Hill in my letter to him that I'm, I'm looking to be successful in it as Stephen Hill has shown to be. And he wrote back in his letter that, that you know, being successful as Stephen Hill has shown is a tough one. It's a tough road. But, you know, um, uh, he, said, he said it can be done. Um, he called... He called your talent, I should bring in the letter, I'm really paraphrasing, he says, okay. but he, he said, you know, your talent are your poker chips, so to speak. In other words, if you have talent, um, you'll be able to create your own destiny. I mean, obviously, people who are talented now, um, if, if you want to call it, a, call it, you know, the A-list in Hollywood or the A-list on Broadway, um, If any of these people wanted to say tomorrow morning, I'm not working Shabbos, I'm not working Yuntiv. They could do it. They could do it. They could do it. That, they could do it. That, that, that's, of course. The, 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 the trick is, you know, um, people, would, people would say, why don't you become, you know, do, do the work, become, become known and become famous. And that, no, 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 but that, that's. Ex yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, that, Which is, that, that's taking the, the truth out of it. Exactly. Exactly. Which is, which is why I find it myself personally very difficult because I, I've been auditioning left and right for as much as I can. But then things that I get callbacks for, I'm very, very selective. Well, this gets now into the conversation of content. Exactly. Content is... is we have this thing called our talent, which is great. And then there's, there's everything that's out there. Now, I don't think you would disagree with me if I told you that 95% or more of the content that's out there is, uh, what's the Latin word? Direk? <laughs> I, 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 I don't think, I, I'm, I'm sure that like in professor's time, it was, it was the Latin word Drek, <laughs> but I'm telling you, it has only gotten oh, yeah. crazier, oh, yeah. crazier. Oh. Look, look, look at the listings on backstage today. I, I, I'm well aware of what these listings, what they're, what they're you know, and, and the whole reality, um, you know, chapter that we're in now. We are looking for real doctors who've practiced medicine in India on Tuesdays when it was cloudy. Yeah. You know? I, 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 if I don't, you I, fit this, you know, give us a call. So the, that, that's much more, I find, the small scale productions right I, f I find that at least in in my limited research that m bigger budgets which yield you know more experienced people still value the art form no question no question um, and I mentioned Michael Moriarty who is a terrific one one the greatest thing I got from him as an acting teacher was 
to create your own work. Yes, that's that, that, that's what everyone tells me. Create that's your what own everyone work. tells me. Um, the, pr the only thing is, <laughs> in order to create your own work, you gotta have capital. No, you don't. No, you don't, and I'll tell you what I mean by create your own work. I don't mean create your own work where, capital for what exactly? What are you talking about? Meaning, I, I wrote a book. Okay. All right, and I'm, uh, I'm working on publishing it. Right. But even that, a, a book is probably the lowest budget production okay. that there is. Right. And even that, it, it put a dent in my wallet. It put a dent in my wallet. So if I wanted to do anything with TV or film, even, even something considerably low budget requires capital. So let me, let me sh give you my sort of people that I saw growing up who, you know, if people were to ask me what path they should take how and how they should do it, two actors that come to mind are Eric Bogosian and um, I'm having a senior moment now. Um, Who's the Latino actor? John. Um, I can't, his name escapes me right now. But these are two actors who wrote their own shows, wrote and performed their own shows, and boom, and performed them. Right, so I want to do that. I want to do that. Right. How am I supposed to do that? Okay, um, it starts with an idea. Right, so I, I have, then you, I have, then you I have a, a screenplay. A paper. Okay. I have a screenplay. Okay. What do I do with it? Um, so now a screenplay is different because now you're talking about a story with a cast of people, correct? Right. I'm talking about these two people. John Leguizamo is his name. All right, I'll have to look him up. Who, uh, wowed the theater world with his one-man shows. These were one-man shows. Eric Bogosian, uh, John Leguizamo did one-man shows. They wrote and performed their one-man shows. It was part stand-up comedy, but mostly monologue, um, heart-wrenching theater that was really, really good. Um, and... You don't you don't you don't take it straight to Broadway, you know. You write something, you do it. I mean, here in New York, um, there there are numerous ways you could go about getting seen. I think now, with social media, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Aren't people just making enough TikTok videos and doing all this, and you know they're influencers now and so yes and how much capital do they you don't we have stars that were made like didn't justin bieber start this way yeah there there there, there are he didn't, he didn't start with capital there are there are exceptions to the rule there are exceptions to the rule but okay, I, I don't I, know i can't i can't advise you about a book i'm not in that world of liter of, of in the literary world i don't know but if you were going to tell me that you had ideas and you were a good actor and, you know, I would say write your own material. This is one of the things that Michael Modari said. He said, write your own material. Don't, don't be the type of actor that sits around and waits for the phone to ring. Write your own material and put it out there. Put it out there. And when I was growing, when I was growing up, there, there were no cell phones. There was no, there was no social media. You know, we had to figure out, um, you know, let's, let's rent a theater space. So it was, it's minimal capital, but you rent a theater space and we try to do some advertising and, you know, you get people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is what Eric, the actors like Eric was, Eric goes in and John Lenguziamo did. And um, it, you know, word of mouth, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's sort of, but before we had social media, that, that, was, that what was, was meant when we said, you know, things went viral. Is that it would just it, it it spread, word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth, and if you're writing your own material, and you're doing it, um, see that's why your screenplay is all different. You're you're saying okay, well I've written a you know piece for 25 characters now. Well now you got to go out and find 25 people. Exactly. Right? That's why I'm saying if you can, maybe there's a story you can tell. 
I would advise people, I mean, again, I don't know if this is what this podcast is about here, but if you're just asking me about how to combine the two, from an actor's point of view, if you could write, you know, things usually start with ideas, put them down, start, you know, putting monologues together. Maybe there's a thread where you can tell a story, start telling stories. Um, it would seem to me that with social media, you could put things out there. How easy is it to put things out there? To yeah. post, upload, and you're out there. Yeah. I mean, how many people are we seeing now over and over again? We say, man, this guy's funny. Oh, she's funny. You know? So it's interesting because I, I guess I just never thought about it from this perspective because I find myself to be drawn much more to towards drama acting. Okay. And I, I, I guess I had never really broached the genre of comedy. Right. And, and by the way, I, what, I haven't really been talking about comedy. When I say, you know, write a monologue. And, and I, I, urge, I would say, take, take a look at these two actors right now, because these, these are the two actors that primarily, um, I don't want to say wrote the book, but if you want to talk about, you know, they had one-man shows, and from there, people saw them, and so people know who they are now. Yes, and once we're on the topic of one-man shows. Yes. I did a one-man show. I know. I put together I a one-man show. And I wanted to know if Professor would be willing to talk about that. The show that I did for many years was a show uh, called Gathering the Sparks. I played eight different characters in the course of about an hour. Um, I told the story of a Balchuva. Wow. And it's the story of um, these eight characters that I play are the characters that Balchuva meets along his journey. Everyone from his mother to a Hollywood producer um, to real uh, historical figures like Mayor Kahana. Um, uh, there, there was another character that I played um, who was real, who spoke at Keene College. Uh, it, was, it was Keene College back then, not Keene, Keene University in New Jersey, uh, who was a black Muslim, you know, spewing all this anti-Semitic rhetoric. Um, and I played these characters, and as a... Um, I played, uh, one of the characters was my grandfather, who was a religious Jew. And um, so I told the story of a Balchuva. It played to well over 100 Chabad houses worldwide. I went to Hong Kong. I went to um, all of North America, Mexico, Canada. Um, wow. England. <coughs> Excuse me. So. And that came out of this whole, what we've been talking about here about, <coughs> excuse me, I should have some tea. <laughs> it came out of this whole idea of create your own work. If you're creating your own work, it's a whole different approach to the business. Of course, yeah. Because, believe me, I had... And I know still plenty of friends of mine who are actors who, you know, are just going to audition, to audition, to audition, to audition. And again, this other element we really haven't talked about at all, content, I mean, that's another reason why you have to create your own, because you're in control. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, there are certain things I won't do in front, you know, with a woman in front of a camera. Yeah. There are certain things, uh, you know, and, and again, there, that's the majority of the stuff that's out there. I'll, I'll, I'll tell one story. Got a minute? Uh, of course. <laughs> um, a film came out in 1992 called The Quarrel. Are you familiar with it? I'm not, no. The Quarrel, uh, it's a terrific film. Um, the writer's are uh, one rabbi who I'm sure you've heard of, Joseph Telushkin. I have heard of him, yeah. Right? Um, and another writer from Hollywood named David Brandis. I think I've also heard of him. So this film, The Quarrel, that came out in 92, was taken from a short story by the Yiddish writer Chaim Grada, one of the most famous Yiddish writers of the short story. And this 
they adapted it for film, The Quarrel, and the story is basically about these two Jews who grew up together in Eastern Europe. Uh, best of friends went through, through yeshiva together. The war comes. They become separated. Both think each other has perished. They meet by accident two years after the war in Montreal, Canada, at Tashlech, by accident. One has stayed observant in his Judaism and from and has become a Rebbe in the yeshiva. The other has gone 180 degrees the opposite direction and has become a secular, cynical writer who lost his faith. They meet. And this play, the quarrel, the story is about this meeting that they have. And they talk about their past, their friendship, their families. Um, it's a very powerful, moving piece. So that's the film that came out in 92. In 1999, Joseph Telushkin and David Brandis decide they want to adapt this film for the stage, for the theater. It's primarily these two characters. There is a third character that comes on at the end, but it's these two characters primarily. I'm living in New Jersey at the time, and there's a theater in New Jersey called the Playwrights Theater in Madison, New Jersey, that devotes itself solely to new plays. That's, that's their mission. And they decide they're going to do the quarrel this new play called The Quarrel. That was a film seven years earlier. The audition notices go out. They're looking for someone who can play an Orthodox Jew. <laughs> so I show up to the audition with my facial hair, with my yarmulke, with my long black Shabbos coat. I read the part. The director, who was not Jewish, and I'll mention that that plays a role here in this story, uh, I'm offered the role. Oh, really? I'm offered wow. the role. And when he offers me the role, I say, thank you very much, but, you know, like the character you're asking me to play here, I, I also observe the Sabbath in real life. <laughs> so, you know, Friday night performances aren't going to be possible, and your Saturday matinees aren't going to be possible. So he says, well, what do you expect me to do? What should I, you know? I said, maybe you can get an understudy. Have somebody else. No, then we have to rehearse everything twice. No, 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 that's not going to work. I said, as much as I would love to do this, I don't think I'm your man. We shook hands. We parted as friends. I get a call three days later. I'm living in Morristown, New Jersey at the time. It's the director. He calls me. He says, Ruvain, we decided to change the schedule, our performance schedule at the theater, and not do performances, not have performances Friday night and Saturday matinees so that you could do the role. Wow. Now you have to understand, this is not done in theater at all. This is not a that, Jewish theater. Yeah. This is not done. Yeah, when that's, Dudu, that's, when that Dudu doesn't Fisher happen. is doing Les Mis on Broadway, the show goes on. Yeah, that, 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 that doesn't happen. <laughs> wow. So that was miracle number one. Miracle number two was, he said, on that phone call, he said to me, I gotta tell you something. He says, when you left the audition that day, I thought I had to find, you know, another actor. He says, I went back to the theater and looked at our reservation book. This was about six or seven weeks before the play was to open. He says, I looked, he said, we had reservations for our Tuesday night performances, our Wednesday night performances, Wednesday matinees, our Thursday night performances, our Saturday night performances, our Sunday matinees, our Sunday nights. He said to me, we had not one reservation for a Friday night or our Saturday matinee. And this wow. is the non-Jewish director's words, he says, I took that as a sign. Wow. And then miracle number three with this story happens where, jump ahead now about eight years, 2008, I had just been teaching here at Yeshiva University just a couple of years, and um, one, of the gr one of the greatest Broadway producers we have here is a woman by the name of Daryl Roth. And um, she saw the production and brought it to her theater, the Daryl Roth Theater, which is an off-Broadway theater, um, DR2, it's called Daryl Roth 2. She has one theater and another theater. And it played downtown uh, for about six weeks, also on a Shomer Shabbos schedule. So, um, you know, um, how do you combine the two? There's no one right answer. <laughs> Create your own work. Um, My father, my father Alarshon used to say, to be successful in show business, you need two things, talent and a good day job. <laughs> <laughs> so.
So yeah. uh, the good day job I have, thank God, here at YU. And, um, you know, I've been directing now at Stern for 16 years. I love it. This is my first year now directing the boys up here, uptown. Yeah. Um, and I'm really excited about that as well. So what else do you want to talk about? Should we plug the show a little bit? Should we plug the play you're, we're doing now? Yes, yeah, for sure. What for sure. Old Timers Game, opening night, April Monday night, April 4th. Uh, it's a, I, I kind of see it as, as a, a show about intergenerational conflict. Okay. Where we have, I don't want to spoil it, but we have, we have the. First we have to mention the playwright. Lee oh, Blessing. Lee Blessing. Lee of Blessing. course, of course. Phenomenal Pul- a, writer. A Pulitzer Prize winning uh, for his play. Uh, a Walk in the Woods, which premiered at um, the Yale Repertory Theater, by the way. When I was a student there 30 years ago, it premiered at Yale Rep, and I remember it so well because the set for that show, it took, the, the, the play takes place in a forest. So we created this just entire forest from floor to ceiling. It looked like, you, 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 the curtain opened, it looked like you were, you were in a, a dense forest. Wow. It was this awesome, awesome set. Um, and that went on to win a Pulitzer Prize, went to Broadway. Um, so this is this play that we're doing is also by Lee Blessing. So uh, no, he's no chopped liver here. We're dealing with yeah. in terms of a playwright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the the more I review the content, the more I see his writing is so beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Genius so writer. He, he's he's written a lot. He has many, many, many plays that he's written, um, and. It was um, it was Josh Siegel and Aaron Nissel who brought this play to me. Actually, I didn't I didn't well, I wasn't familiar with it at the time, and that's what we're doing. We open uh, in about ten days. Yeah, yeah, big stuff, big stuff. Guys, get your tickets. Tickets are going to go on sale probably sometime next week. Okay. Um, yeah, come see the show. <laughs> come see the show. It's it's interesting because m- most of my viewers are actually not YU students. Okay. Um, but you know, I, I hope that we can get outsiders sure. to to come and see the show. Are they in the neighborhood here, Washington Heights, or, or are we being heard, listened to all over the globe? All over the globe, wow. we have we have listeners in the U.S., listeners in Israel, listeners in Australia, wow. listeners in South Africa, um, listeners in England, and a couple other places. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, so I, I, I'm very curious because Professor has has taken on a lot of roles. Do you have a favorite? Um, hmm. Or one that sticks out the most? Other than uh, being a father of five beautiful kids, you mean? Of course. That, that, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the primary role. That's yeah. the primary role. I was referring to roles that and and most recently a grandfather oh my god really mazel tov I, I i'm i've only had that role for about a year and a half now wow mazel so tov I'm, I'm still learning that one that's pretty, <laughs> pretty awesome that's amazing pretty awesome that's amazing um well i i this play the quarrel that we just talked about was is uh was a terrific role to do you know i've done i've done a lot of shakespeare in my time and um Two of the plays that I've done here at Stern over the years, we did Hamlet and The Tempest, and um, you know, just just being able to, you know, do the language, handle the language, the dense Shakespearean language. These girls did a terrific job. Um, I've been in a number of Shakespeare stuff. I was uh, one summer. I remember I was in the Illinois Shakespeare Festival at Yale. We did we did a number of Shakespearean stuff. I love Shakespeare. I love love, love <laughs> Shakespeare. Um, hmm, yeah, um, and I, I, I don't know if I have a favorite, I really don't know if I have a favorite, but, um, you know, back in the day I did, I, I've done musicals, um, I didn't know the professor also sings, oh, yeah, wow, wow, I did not know this. Yeah, I haven't done a musical in a long time, but um, um, some great, great musicals. Um, 
Well, um, and you know, as a director now, I'm able to um, oversee productions, and I get a tremendous satisfaction with that, um, almost more so than with the acting. Really fascinating. Um, Almost, almost. Fascinating. Um, you know, I do a lot of stand-up comedy now. Um, I was just got just got back from uh, Southern Florida, where I do a lot of work. Um, just because the, the there, there aren't a lot of comedians who can go down to Southern Florida for the um, let's call it the um, the the senior citizen community, so to speak. Right. Um, I want to say, you know, 65 and older, but I just turned, I'm in my, I'm 60, so I, I sound like, <laughs> uh, we can Don't say, we can say 75 and older. <laughs> um, and there are very few comedians who can go into a group of, of 75 year olds, let's say, and above, and make them laugh. And the only reason why I can do that is because I grew up with my father, and he did that, that, you know, he was able to do that. So. Um, I do have a whole sort of a borscht belt kind of approach to a lot of my stand-up, so that, that, that helps me in that sense. But um, I, I'm very blessed. I am so blessed that I am able to, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I see myself really as been, having you know, been able to combine my, you know, my Yiddishkeit and my talent. and. Um, I'm at the point now where I feel good, where I can say no to certain projects, if, whether it's because of content or scheduling or whatever it may be. Um, you know, there was a time in my life where it was like, oh, oh, you know, oh, you know, I, like you know, I I know like, exactly like, like the chorus line how you I feel. need this job. Oh God, I need this job. <laughs> yeah. um, I know exactly how you feel. Right. Right. That's why when you create your own work, you're your own playwright, you're your own writer, you're your own director, you're your own designer, and it's freeing. It's freeing because when you can get something under your belt and take it on the road, and it doesn't get much better than that. And, then, and, and, and you're showing off your talent. You're showing off your talent the way you want to show it off. Right. Right? You're not being limited to uh, who knows what. Other cat. people's visions. Right. Right? Yeah, I'll play a, we want you to play this guy who uh, comes into the store and, uh, you know, punches this guy in the nose and then you leave. You think you can do that? You can, <laughs> come on, you're a good actor. You can do that, right? Let's just do that. And you say to yourself, what am I doing here? This is not what I studied, you know. This is this is this is not where my passion lies. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Fascinating. Do your own work. Create your own work. That's the that's the biggest tip I can give you and anybody who is remotely interested in any of this kind of stuff. Um, that's the biggest tip I could give you. Create your own work. Be your own boss. Wow. Fascinating. So I, I, I'm definitely inspired, <laughs> you know, and I really want to. Um, and Demir Tashem, I'll be able to. You will be. You will be. Demir Tashem. Demir Tashem. Um, Where are we holding? We're at 59 minutes. So I'm curious. These typically range from between 45 minutes to an hour and a half. So if you want, we can call it here. If you want, we can continue. It's really up to Professor. Should we take a little break maybe just to? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, let's let's. Pause. All right, we're back. We're back. Yes. Um, so there's this game that I like to play with uh, my guests, and it's pretty much just a conversation starter. So I was wondering, would you like to pick a card? Any card. Any card? Yeah. See, now the turntables have turned. <laughs> the magician becomes the... Ma magician. That one? Is that more than one? That's more than one. All right. Pick, pick whichever one you want. Ooh, this is, this is fascinating. What do you think you'll regret not doing when you're on your deathbed? 
spending more time with my kids. Yeah, I, I feel like that's that, that's that's. You know, it's not about making uh, having that one more gig. You know, yeah, spending more time with my family. Pretty, that's an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Do we get to ask you questions? Of course. How about that? All right. I would say, so I don't have kids yet, so right. I, f I feel like that I can't really answer that. Okay. Um, I would say not pursuing my dreams. Okay. Not pursuing my dreams. You know, letting, letting societal pressure and just the sheer difficulty Stop me. Okay. I would say that that's what I would regret. And, you know, I, I really hope I'm, I'm doing everything in my power to, to fight it. So, and this, and you, this is your first year at YU, right? Yeah. How, how's it going so far? It's going phenomenal. Yeah? Yeah, really, really amazing. I mean, I know you just got back from Vienna. Right. Uh, but even before that, if I were to ask you before you left. It was... It's it's been amazing. Oh great. Yeah. Great. It's been amazing. It's it's really on a previous podcast, one of the cards was what was the most important decision of your life? I think. Or maybe what was the biggest decision of your life? I can't remember. And my answer was that I think that the the most important decision of my life was to go to Shar HaTorah for high school, which is a boarding school. I think that that was the biggest decision because it had a ripple effect that completely altered the course of my life. But I would say the biggest decision was to come to YU because that was, that was much more of a decision on my part. Mm -hmm. So it's been amazing. Awesome. So you didn't take a gap year? I did. Oh, you did? I took three gap years. <laughs> yeah. So you call yourself a freshman, though. So what does that mean? That means that the, <laughs> <laughs> means that the registrar doesn't want to take my yeshiva credits because I didn't go to a YU yeshiva. Hmm. Yeah. And if they Frustrating. Would, and if they would, you would be what now? Technically a senior. Really? I mean, so th they, they don't take three years of yeshiva credits, so right. from anyone. They, take, they would take maximum one, right? Maximum one year, so I, so I would be a sophomore. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious, does, does Professor have, like, any professional dreams or goals that you have yet to have fulfilled. Hmm. I'll tell you, I think about um, my time when I had just started teaching here and doing the quarrel, the story that I told you um, downtown. When I say downtown, the theater was on 16th Street. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, finishing up teaching and then walking 40 minutes or so down to 16th Street, or not even, from 34th to 16th, what is it, two, uh, 20 blocks, uh, about a half hour walk, and walk into the theater to do a performance that night. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, it doesn't get much better than this. <laughs> you know, um, being in New York and, 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 and teaching, leaving my office, going and performing. Um, so that was a very special time for me. Um, look, um, with every play that I direct here, um, I'm, I'm always in awe of the talent that I see here at YU uh, on the women's side and now this year for the first time on the men's side. Um, I mean, I don't think I've ever directed a play with nine men, and let's see, um, at least four or five of them, it's their first play they've ever been in. Right. 
So they've, just by that fact, have upped my game as a director because, you know, I, I, I kind of have to talk to them a little differently than I would, let's say, someone who's had experience on the stage. So um, it's nice, though. It's nice. It's, it's, I feel very blessed, as I've said already, with, this, um, with what I do here. I, what, what, what is it they say that if, if you uh, if you love your job you'll never work a day in your life right and I, and I just feel very blessed that I'm able to um, teach on the Stern campus and now um, this semester coming up town here and directing you guys um, and so I just hope that with every year forthcoming things only get better that's amazing yeah that's amazing. Does does professor see yourself as having any more acting roles in in the foreseeable future or primarily directing? Um one of, one of the good things about the acting business is that um you you almost can't outgrow it. Right. right? There there are always all sorts of different roles. Um let's see what's the, the latest thing I did might, might be soon by you, which maybe, I don't know if your audience is familiar with um, that web series. Um, they've had a few seasons out already now. And uh, Leah Gottfried, who's a very talented woman, uh, is the brainchild behind that. She was a student here at Stern College. Really? Um, wow. Played a very funny, funny role in a play that I did here, a comedy called The Government Inspector, which was really like a one of the very few Russian farces. <laughs> um, and um, so I, uh, Uncle Avi is the role that I play in Soon By You There. Um, but I'm just... Uh, How recently was that? Well, they, they just came out with season three. So this was... I was in, I think, two episodes in season one and one, and one in season two, so. Oh, wow, so yeah. relatively recently. Yeah, you Google it, it's there. All right, there. I'll check it out. Yeah, no, great, uh, well done, very well done. And, and, and look, it costs money to make things that are well done. Right. So, uh, yeah, I'm just, um, I'm, I, I continue the directing, the teaching, and my stand-up. I do a lot of stand-up still. I travel. Um, so my, my plate, Baruch Hashem, is nice and full. All right, Baruch Hashem. Always room for more, though. Always room for more. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I hate to ask it. But, but you're going to ask it anyway. I'm going to ask it anyway. So you do stand-up. Mm -hmm. Can we hear a joke? Can we hear it? <laughs> I love it. Like the, so I once heard a stand-up talk about this very sentence. He said, like, people always ask him, oh, can you tell me a joke? And he said, like, oh, when you meet a doctor, do you ask him, like, oh, can you perform <laughs> surgery on yeah. me? Yeah, yeah. Can you sh show, show me? Show me. Yeah. Could you just hold the scalpel? Let me see what you do with it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, but boy. do you have, like, I, I know I had spoken to SJ. Right. And SJ also does stand-up. All right. So I, I asked him, you know, to, oh, could you tell me a joke? And he said that he has he has one joke prepared for when people ask him that. Oh, really? So I'm I'm curious if, if a lot of comics have that. Um, I don't have one prepared, but what comes to mind is, you know, um, people ask me all the time about my last name, and they say Russell. What kind of name is Russell for a nice Jewish boy? Um, and by the way, I'm not related to any Russells, any famous Russells. I know there are Rabbi Russells in Lakewood and in, in Brooklyn and um, in England. Not related to any of them. And this, is, this story kind of puts a, 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 a spotlight on that, which is that um, my father, may he rest in peace, was born in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1920. I can't believe that's 102 years ago already. Wow. And... Um, Although his name throughout his life, through most of his life, was Joey Russell, he was born with the name Philip Feitelberg. And like many comedians in the 1930s and the 1940s, um, you know, going into showbiz, 
they were Jewish, many of them changed their names. Yeah, you, um, had, you had to anglicize. It wasn't the most popular idea to have an ethnic-sounding last name right. back then, right? Now you have your Jerry Seinfelds and your, your Paul Reisers, but back then, could you imagine being introduced, and now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to hear the comedy of Philip Feitelberg. Right? <laughs> it didn't go over so well, so he changed his name from Philip Feitelberg to Joey Russell. And his whole life, when anyone with the last name Russell would come up to him and say, hey, are we related? You know, he'd say, I don't know, what was your name before you changed it? <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, That's very clever. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> is, is any of your father's work uh, online? Uh, if you dig, dig deep enough, yes, it's there. Um, All right, I, I, <clears throat> I want to see. I, I, bought, I bought a few of his record albums that were on eBay recently. I, I, really? I, I may have bought the last two or three that were still on eBay, but um, yeah, he made wow. a, a record back in the 70s. And um, wow, maybe I'll come back again sometime, and and you know we can hear a couple of uh, yeah, that would be incredible. Yeah, a couple of takes from the album. But, that would be uh, incredible. Yeah, yeah, we did. I guess we digitize it somehow. And we'll we'll put it through. Yeah. <laughs> wow. All right. Should I pick a card? Sure. Or do you want to pick another card? Oh boy, what's your spine? No, you pick. Well, you just went right, so I'll pick a card. I'll pick yeah. One. I read it or you read it? Uh, we, we read it out, read it aloud, and then we both discuss it. What dreams do you have for your children and grandchildren? Ooh. By the way, is the object of this game to think long and hard or just to come out quickly with... The, the idea is that the initial knee-jerk answer is usually the most authentic. Right. So that's the one that so my knee -jerk, I try yeah. and go for. Um, dreams I have my children and grandchildren that they surpass me and whatever I've accomplished that they surpass that um, another thing that comes to mind is the, the, the one lesson my father always said to me in life you know Zia Mensch just be a mensch everything else is just commentary <laughs> <laughs> true right. stuff so um, what father or grandfather does wants nothing more than just to get a lot of nachas from their kids. So, that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I, 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 guess, I guess that, you know, I would feel the same way. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if, if that sentiment will change when I have children in Merit Hashem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll pick a card. Describe a time in your life when the phrase, when it rains, it pours, applied. I know the answer to this one. <laughs> Does the professor have any ideas? Um, well, uh, when it rains, it pours. I guess that can mean for the good or the opposite, right? Yeah. Hmm. If Professor needs a moment to think. I think I do. Go ahead. I'll okay. Get it. You got your answer, though? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And it would have to be March 2022. Adar Tafshin Pei Beis. Wow. Yeah. Has been the craziest month of my life. Between between Stomp Out the Stigma and then Vienna, mm -hmm. it has been life altering. Wow. I don't know the details of either one at the time of this uh, recording, but um, other than that, they were events that happened. But I don't know any of the details. But feel, feel free to ask away. Yeah. You know, this is um, again. This is not an interview. This is a conversation. Look, Shout out to the name I, of this podcast. I, I heard, you know, I have about 100 and, what do I have, six? I have about 120 students this semester. And, uh, you know, everyone who were, was at the Stomp Up Stigma uh, event was raving <laughs> about it, right? So, 
but I heard no details other than just rave reviews of <laughs> that it was a great event. What made it a great event? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm very touched to hear that people uh, felt that way. Um, I, huge shout out to Miriam Bluth. I'm not sure if you know her. I'm not sure if she's in any of your classes. Uh, she was my liaison and huge shout out to her because it would not have been nearly as good without her help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she really did a good job eliciting my story from me. You know, sometimes it felt like it was pulling teeth, mm -hmm. but she really got me to be very vulnerable. And I, I am so indebted to her for that. So I would say that what people appreciated was that I was just really vulnerable okay. and real. And have you brought that to your own podcast? I have. I have. Okay. At least, you know, I've tried my best to. Great. Great. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I can tell you that my experience with you has been strictly seeing how you uh, act on stage. And <laughs> so, uh, you know, sometimes that also takes vulnerability as well. Yeah. And um, so you're pretty darn good in this play. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So so March 2022 has been when it rains, it pours. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just been back to back a crazy month. And then next month we have, you know, the play. So, you know, that doesn't, yeah. doesn't stop. Yeah. Um, you know, you asked me before when I mentioned about musicals and do I sing. So there was a time, oh, I was probably about 20 years old. And I was in a musical called George M. It's the musical about the life of George M. Cohan, great song and dance man. Joel Gray originated the role on Broadway. Bernadette Peters was in it. Um, and I was in a production about 1981-ish in Bridgeport, Connecticut at a theater called the Downtown Cabaret Theater. I had been apprenticed there for a number of years and um, I was in the chorus of this show. And um, one of these classic stories of the star of the show who played the title role of George M. Cohan. I remember the actor's name. His name was J.J. Jepson. I, I don't even know where he is anymore. Um, you know, when you, when you Google a name and you can't find anyone, what, what does that mean? Yeah, <laughs> they really <laughs> fell off the face of the planet. Yeah. Um, I remember that he... Uh, opening night and I have never heard about this but I just remember it he had a blood blister on his larynx and the doctor told him that um, he couldn't sing he could only talk and so he went on opening night, and I don't even, he, he kind of mouthed through all his songs. Second night, doctor told him, uh, after a second evaluation, not only could he not sing, he wasn't allowed to talk either. Oh my goodness. So they asked a little 20-year-old who was in the cast, named Bobby Russell, wow. if he would be ready to go on that night Play the title role as George M. Cohan. I got fitted for tap shoes and I got this and that and the other. And uh, it was sort of the classic story of, you know, the little chorus boy who's the understudy goes on. And I went on and I went on for about the first three, three of the eight, first three weeks of an eight week run. Wow. Um, and that was also the, the, the first play we're talking now. Um, yeah, 81. That was the first time where it, it dawned on me that I could be an actor. 
and there's a little tiny role at the end of that musical um, of a stage manager who comes in and talks to an aging George M. Cohen. Now this had this was a guy who had been a show business legend, a star, and he you know came back later years of his life to come back on Broadway, and he was doing some of his old routines. And um, my job as the stage manager in the play, the character of the stage manager, was to go in and give him some notes from the director. The director was saying things like, he wants this changed, he wants that changed. And George M. in, in, in the script is saying, what are you talking about? These are great bits that I've been doing for 40 years, and I don't need some little kid like you to tell me what to do. And the kid has this moment in the play where he says, these are not my notes, Mr. Cohen. These are the director's notes. And maybe what's worked for years isn't what the director wants now. And, uh, you know, if you don't realize that, maybe you shouldn't have come back. And it's sort of this moment where um, it's a really nice scene where the stage manager is simply coming in at the beginning and just, you know, just sort of reading his notes, reading his notes, and it just, you know, he gets attacked, and so he sort of lets loose. And I was able to do that and to put all of a sudden this flashy song and dance show, uh, all of a sudden there was this little um, kernel of poignancy at the end of the play that the director liked and the other actors kind of, and I kind of shocked myself. And it was that little tiny role of the stage manager, that one little scene at the end there that, that was my first sort of uh, awakening to, hey, wow, theater, um, I can act. It's not just about singing a song or, you know, tap dancing, but um, that was my the, the very first time so I don't know if that's about a raining and it pouring but you know I got I did that I, I, I recognized that and then I went on to play you know the, the main role the title role of the thing um, when I was just a little kid that that was sort of a raining you know when it rained it yeah moment. wow um, and I even have uh, I even have the reviews in the local newspapers. Really? Yeah, back oh, then. Oh, that's so, incredible. With my little young face back then. and um, So. Uh, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's it. I think, uh, I think, uh, you know, Hashem wants us to really use our talents in a kosher way. And not just a kosher way, but a glot kosher way, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so, he wouldn't give us anything that, if we're supposed to use our talents, there's no way in the world that Shabbos could be a hindrance to our success. Of there's course. There's no way that, that kashrish could be a hindrance to our success. It's just a matter of, of how we figure it out, how we do it. That's it. Is it easy to figure out? No, but... There's a way. There's a way. And if you're connected, you know, if you're connected to a tzaddik that you can, that you can go and maybe ask questions to in some way, whether he be in this world or in the world of Emmaus, um, talk to God, you know? And uh, it's about fulfilling our purpose here, taking our talents and really fulfilling our purpose, making a dwelling place in this world for Hashem. So, if we could do that with, with our talents, what bigger blessing can one have? Wow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ruvain Russell, professor. Ellie, thank you very much. This has been terrific. Thank you so much, professor. This has been absolutely incredible and so enlightening for me so enlightening i'll come back if you invite me back i would love to have <laughs> you back on as soon as possible i would right. love that but you have to get some sleep first yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah i'm still a bit jet lagged from yeah. from vienna but anyways thank you guys for listening uh please remember to like and subscribe and i don't know what else you're supposed to say I kind of just end it. <laughs> Your show. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome.